Assassin's Creed Mirage. The game was meant to be inspired by the original Altair game and the Ezio trilogy way back in the day. A game that takes Assassin's Creed back to its roots and that was based on the originals, and one that was supposed to bring the franchise away from those 30 to 40 hour campaigns and be a little bit more realistic. I do want to give a huge shout out though to Ubisoft for hooking me up with an early copy of Assassin's Creed Mirage to play through, review and of course do our story video on. I've got to say after completing Assassin's Creed Mirage in just under 15 hours, it was refreshing to not have to do the same repetitive tasks for another 15 hours like we had to in the previous games. I really enjoyed this game, I know a lot of reviewers didn't really feel the same. But that's okay, because we all have our different opinions, right? But for those that are already subscribed to the channel and know the format of these videos already, you'll be very familiar with how these videos work. They're created to go through the entirety of the game, allow the viewers that isn't too sure about picking up the game. Maybe it's an issue with money, they don't have that right now. Someone that doesn't have time to play through an entirety of a story. Maybe they've got a busy life, kids, family, you know how it is. Or maybe it's just they don't think this is their type of game and they want to watch through and re still live through the story and the gameplay as you would if you purchased the game. I usually do a story video which is very short and to the point after the longer one is done. So make sure you guys are subscribed for that. Ring that notification bell as well to be notified every time a new video does go live because I've got to say there are a lot of Assassin's Creed videos coming on the channel because this story, it definitely has a lot of things to cover. A quick little shout out for some of my socials, so before we do jump into this, go follow me on Twitter, or X is what it's called now, and have a conversation on there about new games, stories, and much more, and let's just have a bit of a debate about what's coming out, what's good, what's not, etc. It's a good way to get hold of me as well, if you ever want to reach out, then definitely do that. But also my community Discord server down below in the description. We have a couple of hundred people in there already, and it's a lore Discord server. If that's something that interests you and you'd like to talk about the lore of different games and talk about what could be, theorize different things and have a deeper discussion with the community we've built, go check it out in the description down below. We have some really cool conversations and different agreements, disagreements in there as well. It's a lot of fun. Go check it out if you want to join that. But let's go for the goal of a thousand likes on this big Assassin's Creed launch. I know for a fact that we can do it. If you guys reach it, I'll give away a couple of copies of Assassin's Creed Mirage for a couple of people in the comments, like we always do on these types of videos. Stick to the end of the video to learn how to enter that as well. However, without me rambling on anymore, everyone, let's dive straight in to the storyline of Assassin's Creed Mirage. You asked me once about this memory. I lied. I told you it was lost. I worried the wrong lesson would be learned. But this man lived many lives, and he has much to teach us. Of course, when he came to us, he was little more than a common thief, scrambling to survive on the streets of Baghdad, dreaming of a better future. Not just for himself, but for all those he saw suffering on the margins. For while he lived in a golden age, at the heart and the height of the Abbasid Caliphate, scratch its gilded surface and you'd find a rot beneath. The Order of the Ancients fought to rise and spread their cruelty through the land. The Hidden Ones, as we were known then, resisted. Striking at our enemy from the shadows, an eternal struggle. Centuries ago, he was at its heart. Basim ibn Ishaq. He honored the creed. He challenged it. So must we. We have it in all of us to mistake the shadows we walk for the light we serve. The time may come when we will be tested as he was. I fear that time is coming soon.
Breathe. Assassin's Creed Mirage begins from the perspective of a common thief who lived in Baghdad, named Basim Ibn Isak. He woke up from a dream of a dark and mysterious figure, one that looked to be haunting his dreams, and once awoken, it was clear that this was not the first time that he saw this thing. There to comfort Basim was his friend, Nihal, Basim and Nihal were thieves together, and both traversed through the city completing different contracts in order to earn a bit of coin and pretty much feed themselves. They're working alongside someone named Dervish, and he's left them both another contract in order to fulfill. This one, from a logo very, very familiar to us Assassin's Creed fans. We make our way to Dervish's home office, and there we ask about this contract. We need to locate and bring a ledger back to Dervish, and once we do, there she was, Roshan. Roshan was a part of a group named the Hidden Ones, and what was contained within this ledger gave us information on a chest that was delivered that very morning, one of great importance. Basim tried his best to sweet talk Roshan into allowing him to track down this chest on behalf of the Hidden Ones, and whatever was inside of it. But she wasn't having any of it. Two of Roshan's best men died in pursuit of this chest. So what makes Basim, a common street thief, any better than them? Roshan then walks out of Dervish's home without muttering a word. But he wasn't done there. Basim wanted to prove himself to Roshan that he could do this. The crate was located in the Winter Palace, just east of Dervish's home. Nihal accompanies us, getting us into the palace without being seen. And when we're inside, we can see what Roshan and the Hidden Ones are looking for. The chest. But not only the chest was there, five golden masked figures walked into the room. One opening the chest to check the contents. And then they walked away. The Khalifa al-Mutawakil, the most powerful man in Baghdad, was curious as to the contents of the chest and asked the figures for a peek inside, in which one of the masked figures was not up for entertaining this idea, with the Khalifa almost looking scared at the idea of challenging them. Who are these five masked figures, and why is the most powerful man in Baghdad afraid of them? This was Basim's chance. He and Nihal entered the room and opened the chest. Inside, a spherical object which produced a hologram when touched by Basim. However, al Mutawakil came storming in and tried to fight Basim for the object, but in a tussle, Nihal took out his knife and killed him. No. Run. The king's son also walked in at this very same time, and the guards all alerted. Basim picks up the object and sprints out of the palace, and there escapes the guards. He returns to his living quarters, where he rests for the night with this ancient artifact. Basim, however, has another one of these nightmares, and wakes up to the sight of Roshan sitting at the end of his bed. Roshan wants to know more around the object that was found, and what actually happened in the palace. Basim now goes on to say something that you will probably want to remember for the remainder of the story. Take a listen to this. That object. It did something to me. I was somewhere else. Cold and frightened. Before I knew it, the Khalifa had his hands around my neck. I it was an accident. I did not mean for just wanted to help. We need to get you out of here. I have a boat at the West End docks. Basim needs to get out of Baghdad. The King's Guards are all searching over the city for his location or people just like him. The only plausible way to do this would be to leave with Roshan for good. However, what about Nihal and Dervish? 
Basim makes his way over to Dervish's home to see an awful sight. However, there was Nihal. In a fit of rage, Basim blames Nihal for killing the king, for causing all of this mess. Pretty rich considering it was Basim's idea to enter the palace in the first place, but I digress. Basim sprints to the docks where he was hopeful that he'd see Roshan, where she had a boat ready to escort him out of Baghdad. However, Basim was caught by a series of guards in the process. However, Roshan showed off her combat skills in the sequence, and they got the hell out of there. Move. What are you doing? Don't think. The next sequence of the game takes place in a new location, Alamut. Basim makes his way inland where he meets with Roshan. Basim is training to become a part of the Hidden Ones, meeting a series of people along the way. Fulad, Ahmad and the elder Rihan, Rebecca the blacksmith and someone named Nur, a good friend of Basim's, were all there and that's who we meet throughout this entire process. Basim and Nur went on patrol one evening and there they came across a bunch of mercenaries all the way from Baghdad, all the way out here, trying to track them down in Alamut. They report their findings back to the camp leaders. Nor volunteers to make his way back to Baghdad and speak with an ally they have there named Ali to see if the order had sent those men. Within this time, Basim took the time to master his skills and before he knew it, went through the initiation to become a full member of the Hidden Ones, slicing off his finger to fit the blade, just like back in the originals. However, just as Basim and Roshan were sparring, Nur comes stumbling back to camp. He left Baghdad in a hurry. Something wasn't right here. Roshan, Basim and Fulad all go to Baghdad to see what's going on and try to put a stop to whatever is going on. It was a very long journey, one that spanned many days, but they set off on their camels to Baghdad.
we finally arrive back in Baghdad, the city where it all began for Basim, and met Roshan and Fulad at the Hidden One's Bureau. It's here that we're told to find and meet one of Ali's closest allies to get a situational update on what's going on here in Baghdad. His name was Beshi. When we meet Beshi, he tells us that our ally, Ali, has been captured and imprisoned. We'll learn that our target is someone named Al Ghul, who uses prisoners and laborers to dig around Baghdad. Ali and his men were marked and taken to different prisons, but Ali was taken somewhere different, somewhere for questioning. We need to go there and free him. We sneak our way into the prison, and there was Ali. We explain who we are and our motivations, and Ali advises that Al Ghul's men transport slaves during the night so that if we find the guards next orders, we will know exactly where they're going next. So they infiltrate the office where Ali grabs the book of orders, and we fend off the rest of the guards and return to the bureau. It wasn't just the capturing and moving of Ali's men that Al Ghul was guilty of, but also the purchasing of migrant labour workers as well. This was illegal, but who would be able to get away with this without raising any sort of suspicion? Well, Ali mentioned only one man could possibly do this. Masood Ali Yaqub. He runs Baghdad soap mills and finds paying work for foreign settlers, most being Persian. In return, he will offer them livelihood when they enter Baghdad and prevent them from being on the streets and going without a bed and food. So, it's now time to take out Al Ghul once and for all. You think your cruelty is well hidden, Al Ghul. For you chose those with little voice whose cries you knew would go unheard. They dug at your bidding, died at your hand, and were cast away like so much refuse. All to scour the desert for some artifact. Even now you haggle for flesh, safe in the Karwan Sarai. You prefer your victims chained and starved. It's time you faced a man unbound. A better background as well, just to connect the dots for those that aren't following too much. The ancient artifact at the beginning of the game, well, these five masked figures are all working together, right? So Al Ghul being one of them, one of the members of the Order, is tasked with searching the deserts of Baghdad for any hidden treasures, using migrant workers to do this, abusing his status as soap mill owner. And that's how they're doing it, efficiently without spending a lot of money. Basim makes light work of Al Ghul, finishing him off in the courtyard. Turn your hate inward, my foe. It is your wickedness that has led you here. Wickedness? To whom? The unenlightened? The feeble who have cast their lot? It is our divine will to rule over them. Our duty to exact their contribution. Contribution? To what? To what could be. To the very knowledge of which lies buried beneath these sands. Some things are meant to stay that way. No, 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 no. These are gifts. Destined to be recovered. They speak to us. As you well know. Me? However, just before we left the courtyard, is is that Nial? We left the facility and met back with Roshan to tell her of what we know around Al Ghul and what he said. The fact they're working to find more and 
dig more of these relics of the past. But why are they doing that? What is the purpose of these relics? Basim also begins to open up here around his nightmares. This thing he sees, he refers to it as a jinni. When Basim left Baghdad and ventured to Alamud to train as a hidden one, it was completely gone. There were no more visions or nightmares. But now he's back in Baghdad. The jinni is also back. Why? And what is it? Is there something here in Baghdad that could have triggered it? Anyway, after seeing Nial, Basim wanted to find her and rekindle their connection, ultimately apologising for the way that things were left before he left Baghdad. However, when they finally met, Nial held no hard feelings towards him. She shows Basim a symbol on the wall, though, in their old room. The same symbol that was on the object from the Winter Palace. She gives us the location of a secret chamber in which holds some pretty crazy armor which we got towards the end of the game. You'll see it later on. But that's a side quest for another day. Now, on to the next task. Our ally Ahmad from back in Alamud was also here in Baghdad. However, he's gone MIA for more than a week. We make our way to his office in a place called the House of Wisdom where in the center of the courtyard, we can see a large fire had just taken place, burning a huge quantity of books. Why they've burned these books, we don't know just yet, but it'll be interesting to figure this out. We move over to speak with the carer of books. However, we found him dead in the library. Some foul play was definitely at play here. The caretaker, however, wrote a place his name down in blood before he died. But more on this a little bit later. As we were searching for Ahmad, we came across an assistant that claimed to know where Ahmad is. And before we know it, we're led into a trap. We confront the traitor as he says, he made me do it. Not referring to Ahmad, of course, but a masked man. One particularly with a golden mask. He commanded this person to keep everyone away from the House of Wisdom's dig site. So that's exactly where we go. Once there, we come across a chest, and within contained a letter from a Dr. Hassan. We of course then set off to the hospital to find Ahmad, and there we learn a lot. This Dr. Hassan has a private laboratory which is kept locked at all times. Here we learn that Dr. Hassan worked for the Order and is corrupt. Basim assassinates Dr. Hassan, and just as he does, in walks Ahmad into his office. They found something into the desert, a mechanism of some sort. It seemed to open a path in the mind, a path to an ancient world. This mechanism somehow seemed to open the door of perception. The ones that have seen this for themselves, well, they're lost. They believe that this perception is reality. All of this, however, being directly below the House of Wisdom. However, back to the previous point, why were those books all burnt in the courtyard of the House of Wisdom? And the location written in blood. We followed the lead, visit the location, and inside the building was a man named Hunian. He was studying a book, one that was not from here, in a completely different language, nothing like we'd ever seen before, and trying to translate it. A woman named Zara, one of the scholars, gave him no choice. So a scholar is one basically below the top ranking of the order. So say you have the one with the golden mask, below you have a series of scholars. After doing a bit more of digging around, we find that Zara was the one that ordered the books to be taken from the House of Wisdom and delivered to her personal estate. We move to her estate and look around and learn that Zara is definitely tied to the order and is corrupt, just like Dr. Hassan, and is in regular contact with someone named Al-Rabisu. We assassinate Zara on her estate and review a note sent from Zara to Al-Rabisu. The fire at the House of Wisdom was a cover-up put on by Al-Rabisu to get that ancient book out of there unscathed. Right now, we don't know who Al-Rabisu is. However, Basim has his suspicions that it's someone named Fasil. Now, Fasil was there when the books were being burnt in the courtyard, and many of the leads that we'd found along the way lead back to him. The House of Wisdom will soon be hosting a symposium. This will be hosted by Fazil, 
the gathering of all of the scholars across Baghdad. This will for sure draw out Al Rabisu. Here we can see that someone informed Fazil of the death of the two scholars, the ones that we killed. And after hearing this, he hastily left. Concluded. Please feel free to explore the House of Wisdom's many fine chambers. You call yourself a great scholar, Fazil. You who burn books and hope the smoke will hide your crimes. How many did you sacrifice in your search for knowledge? How many did you use, damage, and discard in the name of discovery? Now you hide within the House of Wisdom. The house you led astray. But I will find you. And I will exact justice for every soul you savaged for your great work. Fazil was conducting some unethical experiments on human beings beneath the House of Wisdom, doing this with the device that Ahmad said that they had found. This was an object that allowed people to enter different realms, as Ahmad had said earlier on. In order to track down Fazil, though, we snuck beneath the House of Wisdom into the chambers and disguised ourselves as one of the patients. We approached Fazil and this mechanism, and he began the process. One that looked nothing like anything from this era, and very clearly found down below here, or in the sand somewhere. Presumably the House of Wisdom was built over top of this mechanism, so that they can just go downstairs and continue with their experiments and their methods. This is all known as the Great Work. As Fasil got closer to Basim, he takes his chance and assassinates him. Fazil was neck deep in the order. We've ended his reign once and for all. There's two down, three more to go. This may be the place. It may be here where lies absolute knowledge. It, it is not how I remember it. Behind the doors, it looked brighter. But in the end, all we see is darkness. There is still a long way to go in our journey to restoring order back in Baghdad. We find and speak with Fulad, where we are also accompanied by Ali and Beshi. There are a series of executioners most likely carried out by the order on Ali's men. Basim was tasked to find out what essentially happened and who executed his men. Ali will accompany us to a place called Jar Jaria. Someone there must know something about what happened to his men. When we got there, the first place we thought to look out would be a local tea house. This is a place where chatter gets around essentially, and people there may know something or have overheard something. We learn from multiple people that slaves are just going missing, disappearing completely, no explanation at all. We track them down to a nearby camp, free all of the captured slaves, and find out one of the men behind this was named Dogan bin Arslan. Let me know exactly where he lives and where he's situated. Ali and the group of slaves prepare for the assault, in which we find more information on the two order members connected with the main scholar. These two men were named Al Ruh and Al Aishma, the main members of the order being Al Madiqwa. Both, however, were informed by the guards of an intruder, us, of course, and they flee the scene. We return to the bureau to inform Fulad and Ali of what we'd found that there were three members of the order capturing these slaves and three involved, but 
there being three of them, this would explain how their reach across Baghdad is so far. Al Rukh was known as Jesor, who lived in fear of his past and is hiding because of it. Fulard mentioned that this must be Arab general Jasur, Ibn Basil. His past, well, he stole victories and credit from battles that weren't his to be won. And that's a past that he's gone to great lengths to hide. Al Aishma, his real name is Nadir. He has command of ships and is very, very arrogant, even preferring the ships to his own men at times. He's known as Admiral Nadir. And finally, Al Madiqwa. This one is an unknown entity right now, but I'm sure we'll find intel along the way to suggest who he might be. We finally take up the two members of the order, leaving Al Madiqwa as the last. We return to Fulard, where we inform him and Ali of the news. However, we didn't get any identification information. However, when we start talking and telling you of the clues, Al Madiqwa is located at the Great Garrison overseeing shipments from the Turkic mercenaries. Fulad, however, immediately knew who we were referring to. The warlord, Wasif al-Turki. Wasif had just returned from an excursion for the Caliph. And he's, and he's situated at the garrison as we speak, which is a place in Baghdad. However, Beshi has been taken too. He hasn't returned since he went searching. And we can only presume that Wasif has captured him. We need to make our way to the garrison right now to try and save Beshi. However, this must be a successful mission. Wasif controls more than half of Baghdad. If this goes wrong, many, many lives will be lost. Even Alamut. We can't lose that place. Just a reminder, Alamut is the place where the Hidden Ones were trading and where we went to in Rosham. al Madinqua is revealed as a ruthless warlord named Wasif al Turki. Wasif is a hidden power behind the throne, elevating and disposing of caliphs as he wills. He conducts his murderous campaign from the great garrison, and where he now holds the rebel leader, Beshi. This guy will kill and take out anyone that he needs to, no matter how high in power they are, with no remorse at all. Warlord. You cloak yourself in the Khalifa's colors so you can kidnap and kill at will. You are a plague upon the land. Its soil is red with the blood of those you have butchered. All because they sought their freedom. Or because you feared they would. You think yourself untouchable, surrounded by your soldiers. But we will storm the garrison. Free Beshi and see your reign of terror end. We make our way into the garrison, and there was Beshi, knelt in the centre of the courtyard, with Wasif walking out, being handed a sword on his way. He slowly pushed the blade into the chest of Beshi, killing him there and then. Wasif made his way back into the building, when Ali and his men began to help fend off against the guards. We push our way inside the building to find Wasif, and finally kill him. A feather. Isn't that ironic? Was it taken from an eagle who fell out of the sky? A symbol of freedom. A word you did not use often. And never will again. Oh. So this is freedom. Yet, I do not see any way out.
We let Ali into the building and allowed him to show his men that he had the final blow, killing Wasif. Of course we did, but it made it look like he did. The deal was for Ali to take the credit after killing Wasif, so that we can let him bask in the glory to take over Bessie's position as leader, and to essentially lead the rebellion against the Caliph. We now return to the Bureau, informed from Guard of our success as well. However, when tracking down Wasif, we did notice that he was arguing with the governor, Mohammed ibn Tahir. Fulad exclaimed this was odd, so he's definitely someone to keep an eye on for the future. It's time to meet Rebecca and Roshan in another part of Baghdad. Rebecca's heard rumours of an uproar in this part of the city, rumours of harassment from officials at market stalls, goods being controlled and seized. Someone has a hold over the district, most likely the order. There is an annual auction at the market, and there is a very strong chance that our target might show for this. So, it's time to move on out. We speak with a couple of stall owners that were being harassed by the guards. They mentioned their taxes have again risen, but mostly for people not from Baghdad. We investigate a series of missing shipments, and it looks like someone is trying to prevent the arrival of these outsiders. It turns out these shipments are in fact meant for the auction, the big auction that is taking place in the bazaar. Someone wanted to seize these shipments looking for something in particular. Suddenly, we were ambushed by a series of guards, and once taken care of, a note dropped on the floor, signed by someone, Al Anqua. The guards refer to Al Anqua as the tax collector. We find his mansion and search inside for clues, where we learn the tax collector does not work alone. And it's someone not from Baghdad, originally, that pulls the strings here. The letter found contained a scent, perfume, with rose, and an iron smell. Turns out, this iron smell was blood. Basim assassinates the tax collector and obtains information on someone named the harbour master. We reach a warehouse where all the seized shipments were being stored, and inside we find a list of exotic and foreign goods that were seized, most if not all from being outside of Baghdad. However, finally, we come across a note. This is signed by someone with the letter N, and it seems as though they're looking through these shipments for a hairpin of some sort, one that originated from China. They didn't find it, so N will be at the auction taking things into their own hands. We assassinated the harbour master and a few notes scattered around the place. After that, we can see that they never managed to get hold of this Chinese hairpin and they lost it. However, they know the location of it and it will be present at the auction. The order member will also be present to bid on it and try and win it. Let's make our way there. There is a rot in Karch, treasurer. Property stolen, merchants extorted, foreigners tormented. Corruption is rank and everywhere. But you are at its heart. Even now, your poison spreads along the East Road to lands untouched by the Order's venom. I hear you hunger for a hairpin. One up for auction at the Da'irat al-Mal. I will play the rival for your heart's desire and draw you from the shadows. Sitting at the top of Kark's web of power is the treasurer. In controlling taxes and exhorting the merchants of Kark, the treasurer is successfully funding the order at the expense of the people's livelihood, coverting a rare hairpin from the east. The treasurer seized the imports of any foreign objects or artifacts at the harbour, causing great distress for various businesses. Having hidden themselves successfully in the shadows, the treasurer's identity is known to few. It's time to draw back the veil. We get to the auction, sit, and wait for it to begin. The hairpin was finally brought out by the auctioneers, and there, it walked our target, known as Ning. We bid against Ning and are outbid ourselves, so we break the bank and spend over 500 coins on this damn hairpin, sending Ning walking back into her quarters. We, however, need to find out where she went, and if we mention we have the hairpin as a gift, she's bound to grant us access to speak with her. 
You walk inside the room and into a room surrounded by treasures and approached Ning. However, we eventually assassinated her and confirmed the kill. Everything prospers when family is harmonious. Family? The word has no meaning. The notions, even more so. Only the self hears the deepest whispers of your soul and accepts you whole. No one lives alone. But we die lonely. In the end, we are absolutely, simply, truly alone. However, the Ginny is always there, haunting our every move. Return to the bureau. We eventually return to the bureau to inform Rebecca and Roshan of the news. Roshan asks if we'd seen the Ginny again, in which we know for a fact that we did. Basim goes upstairs to reset, and again, another nightmare. We awake a short time later with Nahal in front of us. The Ginny had left and fled from our dreams when we went to train with the Hidden Ones in Alamut. But when coming back to Baghdad, it haunts Basim every time he slays one of the Order. Four are dead at his hands. One of them remains. The head of the snake. However, before we leave, Nahal makes a fantastic point. All this time we've been hunting the Order, the masked figures. But at what point do we question why? Why are they looking for these artifacts? What is the purpose of all of this? Why do they want the artifacts at the beginning? The thing that started all of this. All this time we've just been hunting, but never asking. Basim doesn't entertain this, and he leaves the room. But in the back of his mind knows for a fact this is true. Basim makes his way to the bureau, where he speaks with Roshan and Fulad. The Vinyl Order member is yet to be located, but Ali thinks this is the perfect time to attack and launch his rebellion. However, Roshan mentioned that some around the city are claiming that the new Caliph stole the throne from Abu Adala, the son of Al-Mutawakil, the one that Nehal stabbed at the beginning of the game, where his son walked in soon after when we found the object, just for some context. There are three people that could potentially help us here find out who this final member is. The first being Kabia, the mother of Abu Abdallah, Arib, the poet that we spoke to briefly earlier in the game, and Muhammad, the governor. All will be critical in finding the true identity of the final order member. We first try Arib, the poet. Her patrol answers the door, and it's not entertaining our jargon at all so we approach her directly and follow her however listening into Arib, it doesn't seem like she's part of the order as such but someone seems to be pulling the strings above her on to lead number two the governor we speak to one of the judges that mentioned that as there's a spy that goes in and out of the governor's office every day at noon so we tail him back to the governor's office and make our way inside here, we find that the governor has been tracking the rebels and the hidden ones. However, there was a note found from Abu Abdallah. 
he swears his allegiance to the caliph and will not seek the throne himself. However, someone seeks to purge the hidden ones at Alamut, and this location was given to them by the governor. However, suddenly, the governor walks into his office. He was the one that sold out Alamut, and he was also the one that made sure that Abdallah would not take the throne. He sold out Alamut and the Hidden Ones to try and bring more peace to Baghdad. Abu Abdallah's ambition was too much for the order, so they didn't want him to be the king, essentially. So they forced him to sign a waiver to say that they wouldn't decide that he swears his allegiance to the caliph but will not seek the throne himself and they'd given the throne to someone else that someone well it's Kabir, abu abdallah's mother this doesn't mean that Kabir is the order member right now it just means that they're in cahoots with each other and she is the person taking the throne as opposed to her son we didn't get a name of the person that gave the order right now but the governor leaves and we end up getting the guards on us, so we have to flee the scene. Anyway, we move on to our next lead, investigating a place called the Harem. In Kwabia's absence, she left someone named Farah in charge. However, the Harman, however, the Harem is also where Kwabia's office is located. However, as we tried the door, it was locked. We then meet someone named Makira. She would help us unlock the office door. If we were to do a couple of favours for her, she liked the guard at the front gate, so she wanted us to steal a couple of bits of paint to make her eyes pop. There was a potion on the back of Farah's assistant named Nasrin, which turns out to be alcohol. And finally, a book named The Gardens and Its Mystery, one that is all about herbs, spices and powders. We return back to... So, she told us to go and place that in her room, which is what we did. We returned back to Makira. She was a bit drunk after you know, taking the, the, the so-called potion. And then she finally agrees to open the door up. But when we step outside, Farah was dead. It turns out, Makira played us here. The eyeshadow to make her eyes pop was a herb called Belladonna. In small doses, it's harmless, but all of it is deadly and that book we were asked to get and place in her room well it's a book that contains medicinal poisonous combinations for herbs and spices and it wasn't her room at all it was Nasrin's room this was a cleverly played setup Makira hated Farah and Nassim so with her thinking she would be loyal to Queen Kwabia she killed them framing Nasrin for her death However, Makira slipped up, stating that Kwabia will return from the palace eventually, revealing her location. Kwabia is the head of the order, the mother of Abu Abdallah. We now have our final member, and it's time to seek Roshan's counsel and end this once and for all. However, when speaking with Roshan, she tells us that a more seasoned hand is needed and that we will not be the ones to carry out this task. She will. Basim was shocked and disagreed heavily. Thinking that he'd proven himself perfectly after taking out four of the members of the order, why is she really stopping us? Because that doesn't make any sense to me. However, she finally gives in, telling us to strike quickly without hesitation. Hmm, interesting. But now, it's time to come face to face with Kwabia. So many dead or disappeared. And each trail of blood leads back to you, Al-Bahamut, the last mask to be lifted. You set Wasif on the rebels, unleashed Al-Ghul, sold your son's crown to seize Alamut. And all for what? Some worthless token of a long forgotten age. No matter. I will see you at the palace, and I will cut the head from the snake. We make our way inside the palace, and finally find Kwabia's office. She quickly darts out of the room when spotting us before taking us into a dark room. Misty everywhere. I think it's best for you guys to listen to this part yourself. Searching. 
combing ancient tomes and tombs, tracing forgotten histories, snatching at rumor and at myth. When all I needed to do was wait for you to come to me. <laughs> Our prodigal sire has arrived. Yet he knows not what he is. <laughs> Have you not wondered at your nature? You, who see more, who know more. <laughs> Even my son knew to ask what you were. When he saw your hand touch and wake the ancient skin. What am I? Something more than man. Enough riddles. Speak plainly. Why speak what can be shown? Come with me to Alamut. Beneath its temple walls lies all the knowledge that you are heir to. Your so-called brothers would sooner die than see you claim it. But take heart, Basi. We will prepare the way. And set you free. Ah, no! What poison have you lapped at her lips? She said I was something more than man. What did she mean, Roshan? What lies beneath the temple? That is forbidden ground. There's nothing there for you. I told you of the nightmares. The jinni. You called it weakness. Told me to mend it. I tried and tried, but you hid the way. You let me struggle alone! Not alone! You are not the first to walk the shadows broken, Basim. Stitch your shattered pieces into a hole. Pour your pain into the Brotherhood. Hurt yourself of the poison she dripped and come home to us. No more than a man, but no less than our brother. Or is it too little for you. What if it is? Follow the path she laid out for you, and I will kill you myself. So, just to summarize briefly, Kwabia said that Basim is more than a man. His destiny is more than what he could ever know. When others touched his artifacts, nothing happened. But when Basim touched them, they react. There's something beneath the temple in Alamut. The place that the Hidden Ones are situated. This could provide us with all of the answers. Roshan was keeping this from us. She knew exactly what we were. But was trying to steer us away from exactly where we need to be. She knew what the Ginny was. She knew that it wasn't just a dream. Why it was haunting us, she did maybe didn't know. But she played it off because she knew what the destiny of Basim was. She killed Kwabia and threatened to kill Basim if he travelled back to Alamut in search of a secret ancient chamber. Basim returned to Nial to tell her of what he'd found. Kwabia held all of the answers. As Nial said to Basim... The why can be more important than straight up killing. The truth, however, lies at Alamut. So that's exactly where we go.
But as we get back, we drop to our knees and gasp for a mouthful of water finally, as we see blood flow by us, and further downstream, members of the Order killing the Hidden Ones. They've already started to attack Alamut. <laughs> However, in our dreams, as we get closer to the truth, the Ginny grows stronger. We wake shortly later by a campfire. There was Nur. He saved us. Yal was nowhere to be seen, but Basim presumed that she was alive. Basim leaves the cave in search of the chamber, freeing any member of the Creed that he could along the way, even finding Rayan. We explain the situation, and it begins to make more sense to Rayan. We are the Order's key. For generations, the Hidden Ones have had a duty to watch over an ancient ground held below the temple, defend it from the Order who wish to exploit its secrets. The temple houses its secrets, and even though it's forbidden, even Rehan has no means to access it. Basim, however, makes his way into the chamber, and in front of him on the wall, a symbol, the same one from the artifact, and the same on the wall the Nihal showed us earlier. But then suddenly, <clears throat> a Russian boss fight. <laughs> I warned you what would happen. Last chance. Very well. We finally take her out and weaken her. Finally, we pledge blood to the symbol, our DNA place our hand on the door and it suddenly begins to open, closing directly behind us. Inside was nothing from this era. Whatever is inside must be of grave importance to the Hidden Ones, the Order, and everyone in the world. However, in the distance, another door. Inside, a machine of some sort. Basim approaches slowly, and the memories, they, they start flooding back. I know this place. The owl yeah. disappeared completely, and a bang came from inside this object in front of us. Basim pulled on the lever as hard as he could, Side. It, it cannot be. Neal? actually existed. She was never really there. She was all part of our imagination. Enough! Let me out of here! How? What? What are you? Look! See for yourself!
show yourself! You dare to hide from me now? After all you have put me through! Where are you? A memory of a life long ago, which explains why the Ginny feels so real to Basim, why it haunts him so realistically. It was a memory, one of a previous life. Basim approached closer to a cell, his cell, one that he was in long, long ago in a previous life. There's no going back at this point. He approached cautiously and it opened, behind him being the chamber in which he was reincarnated. The jinni, however, was in the abyss below. Basim stands up to the jinni, and when he does this, he scours back. His memory from a previous life will remain there. See you for what you are. A crippling memory from a past life. And that is where you will remain. It is over. No, Basim. It is only the beginning. For us. For what lies ahead. A deeper understanding of the world we left behind. And our place in it. All my life I wrestled with who I was. Who I was meant to be. And there you were. All this time. The side of me I resisted. A reflection of who we once were. Who we shall be once more. There is so much that awaits us. A new world. Let me show you. I will never see you again. Will I? Will I be alone? You are never alone. Nial was the side of Basim that he resisted, and the reflection of who he once was in a previous life. Nial was the one that pushed Basim to ask the questions to get the answers he deserved. How they mimic each other's every move in the scene as well just shows that they are the same entity, the same person. This will be the last time Basim sees Nial. But she's done her duty, and Basim has learnt what he needs to. Together, they will reincarnate as one and be reborn. Just like the beginning of the game, Basim wakes up with a gasp. He leaves the cave, wondering how long it had been.
it is done. You made your choice. Now, I make mine. Wadaan Roshan bint al Ahad. It was an honor. Come, Barton. We have much to discuss. <laughs> that we do, mentor. Basim steps outside and looks over the cliffside, calling his eagle. However, as the eagle gets closer and Basim reaches his arm out, the eagle didn't recognize him, scratches his face and flies off. This is of course because Basim is reincarnated. He is not the previous soul that he was. He is not the same person anymore. He is a new person. The part of him that was missing is now back with him. And that part was Nihal. And as you'd seen in the cutscene, their entities merged together and they are now one again. In a previous life, Basim was held captive here at this very place as a prisoner. And this memory, this prison, this place, haunted him since then. It all festered in darkness and his dreams, masked as a jinni, to haunt and follow him. But now, Basim has faced his past, his pain, and he's embraced it. Basim lost part of him in a previous life. That other part, well, it was reincarnated as Nial in his mind throughout the game, which is why it was only him that could see her. But now... Basim knows the truth. He is whole again. He remembers. And that, everyone, is Assassin's Creed Mirage's storyline explained. Comment down below your thoughts and theories on Assassin's Creed Mirage. I would love to know. I've not really been around for the previous games i didn't finish valhalla i played a lot of it but i didn't get to the end so basim's involvement in valhalla and potentially even before i don't really know too much so if you guys do know please comment it down below and you'll probably be doing a massive favor for a lot of other people in the community as well that just want to understand a little bit more as to what's going on here but don't forget to join my social medias as well. Obviously, my Twitter or X down below. Go give it a follow. And of course, my community Discord server. There we can detail everything that's happened. And we can just go through loads of lore in the Assassin's Creed franchise for those that do know. So go and check those out. Look, for someone that hasn't really played many of the recent Assassin's Creed games, I absolutely loved this one. I thought it was a really fun playthrough. I loved the characters. They were all pretty much really likable. Other than Roshan's voice... Did get on my nerves a little bit why was it so deep as she just smoked 20 to 40 cigarettes before recording this session <laughs> like i just don't know but nevertheless i really enjoyed it i thought it was good and it was a good length as well any i think it probably could have been a bit longer but at the same time i'm kind of glad that it wasn't because it would have just been the same repetitive tasks over and over and over again so yeah well done ubisoft you've nailed it this time i think but there's a lot of other videos for characters, especially Basim's backstory and so many other things to do on videos. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel and stick around for those videos because there's going to be loads of them coming on the channel. But comment Basim down below if you've made it this far into the video. And if you want to be entered into win a copy of the game, leave a like if you did enjoy. Let's try and get to a thousand likes and I'll pick someone that comments Basim down below. Don't forget to subscribe, notifications on. We'll see you guys next time.